I think the the Nero Red of Ivis view makes sense. It's it's referenced by Augustine. It was referenced by Sulpicius Severus. Augustine actually wrote in one of his commentaries that it was the view that so many of the early Christians held that Nero was going to come back from the dead. So it's got very strong provenance. It's just what is, again, I would have to ask, you know, what is it, if it was written in AD 95, what is, what is it supposed to be teaching? What would the potential, uh, um, what would a potential speedy fulfillment look like during that time frame? Because we don't know, we wouldn't know who the beast was. We wouldn't know, you know, it, it doesn't seem to fit into that time frame. Just going by the, the, uh, the, the internal evidence itself, let alone the historical evidence, which is open to speculation. Welcome back to Curious Christianity. Today we are talking all things eschatology. And I have a guest that I have actually debated with and argued with over eschatology. So while we may not agree on everything, I am very confident that this is a person who has studied a lot about the end times, who has taken it very seriously, and is now here to help unpack a lot of issues and subjects regarding the end times. Because while we can disagree on details or specifics, we can still be brothers and sisters in Christ and have faith that Christ is coming again. And so I have Brian Simmons, who runs the YouTube channel, All Things Eschatology, and has devoted plenty of time and energy to this subject. He has debated many other people, much more qualified than myself, but has uh, descended to come in and chat and talk with uh, us today. So Brian, welcome to the channel. I hope that wasn't too much of an introduction for you, but um, I'm happy to have you here. Well, thanks, Adam. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so you've been studying eschatology for many, many years, and your YouTube channel is called All Things Eschatology. How, how did you end up falling in love with this topic or deciding that you wanted to be so involved? Uh, well, it actually uh, started when... Um, uh, well, just to give you some brief background, so I was raised as a Roman Catholic, and I was in the Roman Catholic Church for 30 years. I wasn't a very good Catholic, but um, when I was about, well, I guess when I was about 29, I uh, I was born again. I accepted Christ. I was baptized by immersion in a, in a Baptist church. I joined the Baptist church. And about a year later, uh, while well, I was studying the scriptures daily and all of that, and about a year later, I felt a call to uh, to the ministry. And so I ended up getting licensed and all that. I went through the preliminary, all, all of that. But uh, I noticed that when I was, um, I would hear preachers, I would go to conferences and I would hear, you know, visiting preachers and missionaries and whatnot. And they would talk about eschatology. And I noticed that a lot of what they were saying wasn't really lining up with what I was, was what I was seeing in the Bible. And so I started reading books on eschatology. And uh, as, it, as it happened, I, I ended up, uh, moving into Calvinism, and I guess it was the spring of 2005. And then shortly afterwards, I discovered a book by J. Stuart Russell called *The Parousia*, which is basically is a full. It's basically a um, an anthem for the preterist uh, system of doctrine for fulfilled eschatology. And so I started to. I felt that I was. Uh, I needed to move in a different direction. And so I ended up uh, joining a, um, well, I didn't really join, but I started visiting with a man in Pensacola named Joe V. Thomas. He had a church called uh, Pensacola Orthodox Preterist Assembly. And I ended up sitting under his ministry for a while. And that's what got me into fulfilled eschatology. Well, fast forward a couple of years later, um, after, um, you know, being in the fulfilled eschatology um mindset for a couple of years. I saw that it had some serious problems. I moved into universalism for a short time, and uh, I ended up renouncing the view in 2007. Now, uh, there was a guy named Todd Dennis who was running, um, who was probably the biggest promoter of preterist doctrine at that time. He was running a website called Preterist Archive, and somehow my I had a little blog called New Covenant Truth, and I would post articles. Didn't have much of a following, but um, for some, through some concatenation of circumstances, he picked up on my, he started monitoring my blog 
And I remember posting an article to the effect of, um, you know, full preterism leads to universalism. Well, he ended up posting it on his page and it ended up getting me involved in, to, in the preterist futurist debate world. So I had all these people, they were writing hit pieces. They were, they were writing articles against <laughs> me. I had a guy uh, on Kurt Simmons, uh, no relation. He wrote a, he wrote an article called Simmons versus Simmons, you know, full preterism doesn't lead to universalism. So it ended up getting me uh, getting me acquainted with some of the main players in the preterist movement, like Sam Frost, uh, Jason Bradfield. I did a lot of um, debating with those guys, you know, back and forth on the chat forums. Uh, and uh, eventually I, um, I started a blog called the anti preterist blog. I ran that for three years. And in 2011, I, uh, I, I was very burned out and I felt I was just spinning my wheels. So I had, uh, I was in the process of relocating to Dallas. I had my family was moving out there and uh, I, uh, I I needed to get back into the workforce because I had a, um, I was working for myself and the, the business was kind of winding down, wasn't making a lot of money anymore. So I said, I need to focus on my career. So I said, well, let me take six months off and a six month hiatus from apologetics and just focus on my career and other things. Well, six months ended up being eight years and the eight year hiatus during this time I, um, I got a university job. Um, I, I was actually working at SMU for five years and I ended up studying, buying a lot of books on eschatology and comparing different views. And what I would do is I would, I was, I would read one book, say like a dispensational book. And I would say, well, let me see what the other, what the other side has to say. And I would do that comparing different, different systems of theology for, for eight years on and off. And I noticed one thing, I noticed that everybody that I was reading, they all had something truthful to say, but they didn't have the whole truth. And so I said, well, you know, all of these different views, you know, within this periphery of different systems and ideas, if you can just get somewhere in the middle, uh, you could take it all in. And so that's what I started doing. I started just getting sifting through, through, through volumes of, of uh, theological literature, uh, listening to debates, also reading a lot of books. And I started forming my own understanding, which was based on what I was, the conclusions that I came to in 2009 after reading E.W. Bullinger and understanding his, his take on, on the, on the, um, the timing mechanics of the first century uh, of, of the coming of Christ, what would have happened had the Jews accepted uh, the, the kingdom. Was, I'm making it long, but I'm going to, I'm going to cut it short at that point. So in 20, 2019, I actually, um, I left SMU and I actually got an office job where I had a lot more time to study and a lot more time to get back on, on, um, on YouTube and whatnot. And then, uh, of course, with the pandemic, in 2020, when they sent me home, I became work from home. And that's really where I started doing this again. But it's really been, it's really not been just me, you know, sitting there, uh, you know, giving my own opinions. A lot of it, I don't do very much teaching. I actually, um, I only have like maybe 20 teaching videos on my channel. Most of what I do, what, what I love to do is getting people together uh, with divers views and really just cranking it up to in third gear and trying to trying to you know iron sharpening iron and trying to get people to challenging other people's views i notice that's what you do you like to challenge other people's views as well yeah. so i think we're kindred we're kindred spirits in that regard and that's really great I think we really are, Brian. That is actually, yeah, what I enjoy the most. <clears throat> now, my uh, buddy actually messaged me the other day and he's like, Adam, you've got to produce more teaching videos. He's like, your discussions are good. That's great. But you know what? Some other people just need just the teaching portion. And I'm like, okay, okay. All right. You're right. You're right. I should. So his videos are actually the opposite. So his channel is the epitome. So shout out to oh, Nathan. Okay. He's uh he's a specialist in the gospels and um, new Testament work. So, um, but so uh, yeah, he, we actually do the opposite. So he mostly just does teaching. He just, you know, sits in front of the camera and will talk to you and explain stuff. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I usually prefer the conversations, but there is, there can be some value in doing some teaching, but yeah, we'll have to maybe have some other conversations about, um, many other subjects. Cause, uh, I've got some other fun ones. I've got some things that don't even matter, <laughs> right. um, but they're still interesting ideas that I think are worth thinking about anyway, but yeah. 
Well, that's great. So, I've seen so you've you've got a lot of great stuff on your channel as well. I've been been dipping through some of your videos, and like I said, you know, you seem to be a kindred spirit because you're not just out there trying to promote your own opinion. You're out there trying to shake things up and get other people to think. And I think that's I think that's really where you make the cut in apologetics. Um, because you know, the teachers, the people that run teaching ministries, they're a dime a dozen, but the people that do what you say you do and what I do are not so, not so common. I would agree with you there. I would agree with you there. I, I would say that, um, I don't know. I think some of the teachers make more money, uh, doing this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do think that, yeah, that's what I feel like is really lacking in a lot of other content is that they might teach through something and I'm like, okay, wait, 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 but what about this and this and this and this? And I, I feel like I have all of this long list of objections to what it is they're saying. And for me, you know what? I, I just, I'm, I'm rather new to the online aspect as a whole. And I've done lots and lots of study behind the scenes. And the first time actually I was looking to have a debate online. Well, what, what was the first thing they asked me is like, do you have any debates? And at the time I didn't have any, right? And so I totally get it. Like, you know, and it was a much larger YouTube channel as well. And it's like, yeah, they weren't really wanting to take on a new, a new uh, person for, for a debate. So I had to kind of get started somewhere. And so actually that also is why, like, um, so I did a young earth creationist debate, not because that was my intention, but it was because he was the only person who would debate me at the time. Right. That was a good debate, by the way. Are you talking about the one with, uh, with Kent Hovind? He wasn't the first one, but uh, the one with Ken Hovind was that was, uh, was, a, was a very was a nice good debate. debate. A lot of fireworks in that one. Yeah, that's what everyone said. So it's it's got a good chunk of view. Good old Standing for Truth channel. So thanks. Shout out to Donnie again for all of the uh, opportunities. So, but yeah. So let's talk more about you. <laughs> I'm sure we'll get more time to. Yeah, not not that you can't ask questions, but. Um, See, you know what? I, I love the way that you you actually gave this intro about yourself because that is exactly to me how your content feels as well. You you like you're in all of these different arenas and places. And talking about this journey, you just had this radical journey from Catholicism to Calvinism. Now I'm I'm guessing, does that mean you've left Calvinism? Um <clears throat> no, I actually haven't left Calvinism, although I don't usually I, I don't. There's reasons why I don't take the name is because it's associated with, um, with determinism, a more deterministic outlook on things. And I think determinism is fine. You could say that God determines all things. But when I think you say that God determines, uh, predetermines all things in eternity, I think that opens up a, a can of worms. And so one of the things that I did when I, um, when I left Fulfilled Eschatology is I started studying the church fathers. And I noticed that, well, none of the, none of the church fathers really had this view of this hard deterministic view. Uh, and so I, I tempered it out a little. And, and what I did was through study, I eventually came to the conclusion that whatever God does ordain, he ordains it within the, the time space continuum. And so he's got, a, he's got opportunity to move things around. Nothing's really set in stone until it actually happens. And uh, William James, the, the psychologist and philosopher, he also influenced my view in his, um, in his treatise on, on determinism versus indeterminism. Uh, he showed that, um, you know, there's a quote that I can post in, in the comments section. Um, but there's, it's, you know, it's, it was a gradual journey away from say deterministic Calvinism to a view that's more in, in touch with say uh, patristic Christianity, but not the same time. I think God does. I do believe in, you know, uh, unconditional election, you know, irresistible grace. And this goes back to when I was uh, in the independent Baptists and we were knocking on doors. We were, you know, going out, we, we had a church van and we would go out within the community and we would knock on doors and we were trying to get people interested in, in Christianity, trying to get, trying to get people saved. And I noticed there was a general apathy amongst a lot of people. Well, we understand, you know, this guy's going through hardship. You know, he just lost his wife. He's, you know, he's got a drinking problem. He's got a drug problem. It's like, why don't, you know, you know, your life is miserable. Why can't you accept Christ? And, uh, you know, it came to my realization one day when I was reading, it was either a, a, a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, or maybe it was a, a, 
a, a, um, a, a sermon. It was a hearing a sermon by L.R. Shelton, but he said, you know, how can a dead person make a decision? And I started from that point. I said, I said well, you know, that's really, that's true. You know, a dead person, can't, <laughs> dead, person <laughs> dead people can't make decisions. And so it got me into Calvinism, but I still identify with Calvinism. I just don't uh, identify with the deterministic um, as some of the deterministic aspects of Calvinism. Let me just leave it, leave it at that. So why don't you become a Molinist? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, you know, that goes, you know, that goes back to prepackaged, um, you know, prepackaged systems, uh, systematics that have already been prepackaged. What I like to do is now, if I read Molinistic literature, which I haven't read much of it, there's probably going to be, uh, you know, uh, elements that I agree with, uh, but I'm not the type of person that likes to, that likes to visit a prepackaged system. So, okay, this is what I'm going to be. I'm going to be this, or I'm going to be that. I usually end up in, this is just the way I guess my mind operates is I usually end up taking aspects of any theological system, which I feel are accurate without necessarily committing to having to to wear the hat for that theological system. So same thing with mm -hmm. preterism, same thing with dispensationalism. I think there's aspects of those systems that I think are true, but I'm not going to just because I believe, you know, a few things, I agree with a few of their tenets, doesn't mean I'm going to go the whole way and start wearing the hat. You know, I don't know, man, I, I might end up nicknaming you Brian a la carte Simmons because <laughs> you just like take what you want. But I guess uh, like, Molinism it, just, why yeah. can't you know this is the thing? Why can't we? There's no rule that says we have to, it's just that's what people do. And you know, it's monkey see, monkey do. Behavior is, I think, one of the biggest influences that people have. They see people doing something and say, Well, that's what I'm supposed to do. But when you think about it, sit back and think about it, you realize that's you know, monkey see, monkey do. You don't have to, you know, you could go off and do your own thing as well. So well, you know, and that is, that's what I appreciate about you. Um, and again, like the aspect that, yeah, I feel very much a kindred spirit with as well, because, um, yeah, it's, it's one of those like, yeah, why can't I think for myself? You know, it's right. like, Hey, yeah. you, you say this, but you know what? I'm reading the Bible. I'm looking at this as like, this doesn't fit your, your system doesn't seem to fit perfectly. And so, yeah, you need some, some nuance. And so I do appreciate the idea of nuance. So but yeah, I, I think that there are some aspects that the way that you've described some things to me seems like, yeah, you you could kind of adopt a, a type of Molinistic idea or thinking. So for example, uh, counterfactuals. Counterfactuals, of course, is the big crux of Molinistic thinking. And a lot of the things that even we talked about in our debate remind me a little bit more of that idea where it's the if then, if you do this, this will happen. If you do that, this will happen. And the classic example for Molinism is that of King David when he's being hunted down. And he says, you know, he prays to God and he's like, hey, if I go to the city, will the people give me up to Saul? And they're like, he's like, yes. And he's like, okay, so what's David do? He doesn't go to the city. So, and then of course, you know, the question is like, okay, so was the prophecy false? Well, no, because it was a conditional statement. Right. And so anyway, that's just one of the, the interesting aspects. And um, yeah, I definitely understand like there are always nuances. Even I have nuances inside of Molinistic thinking, but I'm a little bit closer in that range at the moment. So now let's see. Now you went <laughs> from all of these and then you went to me to probably the two biggest other extremes inside of any Christian conversation, full preterism and full universalism, right? Now, I, I actually would like, could you explain a little bit to everyone else, what is full preterism? Because I know for those who are in eschatology, they know what that is. But in my experience, the average Christian, they don't even have any idea what preterism is. Even if you said, oh, I'm a partial preterist, they'd be like, what is that supposed to mean? You don't eat meat on Sundays? I don't, you know, so please help help everyone else understand what is preterism. Well, yeah, preterism is basically a view that, in a nutshell, states that um, the eschatology, a lar large portion of eschatology, if not all of eschatology, was fulfilled in the events 
uh, leading up to and uh, culminating in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. So whereas we would think cla classic uh, Christianity would would tend to view things like the end of the world, uh, the burning up of the of the uh, the material heavens, the material universe, the purgation, the new heaven and new earth, in a physical sort of recreative sense, like we would think of, uh, you know, when we think of a new heaven and new earth, we would think of well, it's going to be a new earth, one that we can live on, and all that. They think of it in terms more of a covenantal, a spiritual, metaphorical covenantal. Um, uh, they they take that approach, and so what basically what full preterism is basically says that all bi biblical prophecy was fulfilled in AD seventy, and that it was uh, connected with the end of the Mosaic dispensation or the Mosaic age. That what we're looking for uh, now is really there's nothing else left to to hope for. There's nothing else left to look for. So this is the world. What you see is what you get, basically. And the only way that you're going to have a relationship with God is by accepting Jesus Christ. But he has no more future plans for humanity in mass. There's not going to be a future judgment. There's not going to be a future, mm -hmm. um, you know, a future uh, resurrection. The resurrection was figurative or it was it was spiritual or it was covenantal. You get different different ideas as to what that resurrection consists of. Now, there's some that say, well, you die when you die. Um, you're you're uh, you're resurrected. You're, you get your resurrection uh, body. So they carry certain things over, and this is the thing that all full preterists do. They all carry things over, unless you go with like say I O, where everything ends in A D seventy. So you have that that view to to uh, to consider as well. But yeah, it's basically all prophecy has been fulfilled. There's nothing. Every every text that speaks of the end of the age or the um, you know the consummation of the eons, you know. Of the ages. It was talking about the Mosaic Age, which ended in AD 70. The coming with clouds is talking about a judgment coming, which occurred in AD 70. It was it was metaphorical. It's poetic, um, oriental poetic imagery. It wasn't meant to be taken literally. And so basically 2000 years of Christian eschatology has been wrong. And we don't, you know, this is it. We're in the new heavens and new earth. And there's really nothing else to look forward to. Can you give me an elevator pitch? Why would somebody even convert to full preterism? Because in my experience, the average person, when they hear about it, just think it sounds like the craziest thing ever. They can't even imagine somebody going to this. But I, I've met entire churches hold to full preterism. This is not like, I mean, it is more fringe than mainstream Christianity, but there are hundreds, thousands of people that believe this. So what's what's the reason that they convert to full preterism? Well, the reason in many cases, I think, is that if there's, I'm not, don't want to falsely characterize anybody, but I've seen in my 20 years of being on the battlefront, uh, I've seen a lot of people getting burned or turned off by, say, dispensationalism, which is one form of, of eschatological extremism. Um, and it's, it's you know, it's conservative in, in one aspect, but in another aspect, it has its extreme qualities. And so people, what they do is they run to the opposite. There's a, there's a mindset that among certain individuals uh, is is manifested in when rejecting one extreme, running to the other, and so preterism mm -hmm. is that other extreme. And what what I think what leads people to that view is the I want to say the medieval notion that everything you know that there's a mystical sense in which we're to read these prophecies, and that doesn't mean that we're we can't see figurative you know figures of speech or symbols or anything like that. I'm not saying that those things don't exist, but you know the medievals they had a sense that you know everything that you know was veiled in, in mystery, and so it's easy when you have the you know some of these interpreters of say like the 17th century and in the 18th century that would basically just pull stuff out of their hats. Uh, you know, and some of them were good, like Matthew Henry, if you read his commentaries, I mean, he's got some great applications and some great interpretations, but some of the stuff you got to read, you're like, well, how, where did he get this interpretation from, from this text? So what it really is, is it's a deconversion process where you have to get somebody to look at the scriptures a new way. And the way they do that is they take 
Typically, they take time texts like soon, words like soon, near, at hand, and even adverbs and, and um, you know, quickly, um, even, um, you know, pronouns like we, you, uh, and what they do is they try to force into a, an exclusively historical uh, interpretation. So, you know, the grammatical historical interpretation, that's been pretty much the norm since, I would think, since the early 1800s, since Moses Stewart made it made it more fashionable than the allegorical interpret interpretive mode but now we're dealing with an ex you know grammatical historical but exclusively historical interpretation so that's a different bird uh, so that's basically taking literature if you were to take the the US constitution and you were to say well you know none of this applies today because it wasn't written to us it was written to americans <laughs> who were living in the 18th century and if you think about it well that's true it was written to and so how can it apply to us so you have to ultimately you have to un, um, delve into the authorial intent was it the intent of the writers or the drafters of the constitution that it was only to apply to them. And so there's a series of arguments or a series of hoops that you have to jump through to address those arguments. But to an, to an, um, to an intermediate uh, student of the scriptures or someone who's only been studying theology for a couple of years, maybe knows a couple of Greek words, you know, knows some of the theological lingo, they've, they've, they've read a few books. Uh, and so to, you know, it, it, it really gets that level of, of students more than it does, like, say, someone like you or myself who've been studying a, a lot longer and know, you know, know some of the, we'll see those red flags pop up when they, you know, when it's time to, to, to pop up. Um, but yeah, it's what gets somebody interested in that view is usually it's a reactionary mindset combined with, I think, a deconversion or a, um, a deconversion process where they have to, where they learn to read the Bible a new way. And that's all part mm -hmm. and parcel of, of the, the, um, the mindset that leads them to accept full preterism as a, as a viable system. And of course, can combine with time text soon, quickly. Well, it must have, you know, inerrancy. Well, the Bible's inerrant. And he said, you know, the end of all things was at hand and the Lord's coming quickly. The Lord's coming soon. And the Bible's inerrant. Then it must, he must have already he must have already come. And so that in that light, full preterism makes sense. This, this really falls into the category of what I call the one, two punch of Satan. And that's to me where, where Satan comes along and he lies to you. He lies to you. Right. And then one day you finally wake up and realize like, Oh, you know what? Satan's been lying to me. You've realized the truth about something. And then he comes in with the immediate second lie. You're right. I did lie to you everything I told you was a lie. And then you immediately jump right out back and he throws you out the back door. And that's kind of, to me, what it sounds like you're describing is they, they kind of like, they find a crack in dispensationalism or something. And then all of a sudden it's like, Oh, wait, wait, that's wrong. And then they throw out the whole thing and immediately get thrown out the back door. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much what happens. So it basically causes somebody to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's extreme view. Now, you had mentioned universalism. And this is one of the things that not a lot of people know. Todd Dennis, with whom I was in contact um, briefly um, around the time I left for, uh, full preterism, he was trying to spin a system called um, – uh, preterist idealism. And I was actually a preterist idealist for a few months, but he actually did some historical research on the origins of full preterism. And he actually traced it back to the American universalists. Now I've had a chance to, to examine, um, to do my own historical research. And so this actually was the original form of full preterism. So you know, the American hmm. universalists, they were located mostly in Boston. There was about I want to say almost half a million of them at one time, but it's mostly the, the first half of the 19th century. And they're spearheaded by a number of writers. One of them, um, uh, his name was Hosea Ballou. He wrote a book called, um, uh, well, he wrote actually two books. One of them was called Treatise on the Atonement. And the other one was called a parable, uh, Notes on the, on the Parables of Our Lord or something to that effect. And in that book, that this was written around 1804, 1805. In that book, he suggests that the, the sheep and goats judgment 
in Matthew 25 were fulfilled mm -hmm. um, in, in, in AD 70. Now he was a universalist. So they were using universalism as a platform for teaching that all men will be saved saying, you know, things like the lake of fire, that's just an emblem for the destruction of Jerusalem. They would point to old Testament texts like, you know, Gehenna that, you know, this is talking about, this is talking about something that's physical. This is talking about a time space judgment. This isn't talking about some fire that's burning in eternity. And so some of their literature actually have, but, um, you know, it, the, the problem with the problem is, uh, with, with later preterists like J Stuart Russell and, uh, some of the, the pseudo, or I should say the academic guys like, like Milton Terry is, I don't think they, they knew anything about the, the early preterist literature um, like the universalist literature, because by the by the time by the end of the Civil War, universal universalism wasn't really a, a big huge thing anymore, and it kind of you know kind of ramped down. But yeah, um, you know, universalism I think has a lot of has a lot to commend it if you're going to be a preterist, a full preterist, because you have to say, well, what's after, you know, what's after the destruction of death, and what's after the after the lake of fire. I mean, if this is a time space judgment, it happened in AD 70. How can you say anybody's, you know, how can you say anybody in the age to come is what do they need to be saved from this? All everything, everything was relating to the destruction of Jerusalem. So it does create some, some issues. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I watched your, your debate with um, one of the full preterists. I can't remember if, is it Jimmy or I don't remember, uh, but um, yes, I felt Jerry, yes, mm -hmm. I felt like your questions were very potent and very powerful. Uh, I did not feel like he was uh, having really any good answers to many of those questions. It's like, yeah, what are we saved from? Like, what what's yeah. going on? These were uh, very potent. And so, Thanks. but but you would say that it's okay to be a partial preterist. In other words, there is something about the Bible that takes place in 70 AD. Because for me, this was also something that as a young evangelical Christian, I had never even heard of preterism. I hadn't heard of preterism until I think R.C. Sproul was the first person that I had ever heard articulate the word preterist. And at the time I was like, what is he talking about? And began to even hear about this idea that 70 AD has anything to do with the Bible. So but you you do think there are some connections between the Bible and 70 AD. Is that right? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think that, that 70, AD, 70 AD is really, and I don't want to over, overstate this. I think, I suspect that 70 AD is a major, is a major um, dispensational marker. I do think that there is a twofold, um, you know, eschatology, there is a mosaic eschatology, there's an Adamic eschatology, but I don't see, I don't, I wouldn't go so far as some of the, some of the um, partial preterists in saying that, um, you know, that Christ, that the coming in clouds happened in 80, 70. I think that was part of Israel's kingdom program. And I think that actually failed. Um, and that's another story. That's something that we might get into, but, uh, you know, failure doesn't always mean, you know, what say the critical, uh, ac academics think it means. Um, it's something that where, where the first fails so that the second can be established. And so, <laughs> so Israel's kingdom that they were waiting for, you know, it was on the front burner, but then you see it getting taken off the front burner and take, put on the back burner. And then you see what happens is the kingdom's established, but it's a its spiritual e evangelical form in AD 70. And so, yeah, the kingdom was established, but not the phase, the particular phase of, of the kingdom that was being looked for because, um, you know, restoration of sonship is, is, um, is something that wasn't fully, I think, addressed in the Old Testament. We know about restoration of the, of the, um, of the cosmos and restoration of the, of man's anthropology. But what about restoration of sonship? When man sinned, he lost his sonship or he at least lost consciousness of that sonship. And so this was something that wasn't really addressed too deeply in the old Testament prophets. And it's something that ha was one of the reasons why the, um, why Israel uh, rejected Jesus Christ was because they were waiting for this, this potent King who was going to do fulfill all these prophecies, but their hearts weren't ready to, to receive the kingdom. And so the kingdom had to be established in a manner so that sons could be regathered. Um, so Israel could be 
um, could be saved spiritually, so that there could be a restoration of divine sonship, not just from among the Jews, but from among the Gentiles as well. And that's the kicker right there, because in AD 70, you have the Jews being, being cut off, and then you have the Gentiles, uh, the kingdom being given to another nation, which is, of course, going to be the Christian church. So yes, it's a definitely a, a, a dispensational marker. But as far as that kingdom, um, the, the parousia itself, I think that is connected with Israel's kingdom program. I don't think it's connected with the uh, the, the bringing in of the evangelical kingdom, which, which occurred in AD 70. So I do have a different take on that. So since it is called AD 70, does that confirm that it is Daniel's 70th week? That's a good one. Um, you know, I do hold since, okay, so I'm, I'm historic pre-mill. And so I do hold that, um, that that last week is actually future, but you know, I could see where somebody, where somebody would say that the, the 70th week was, was fulfilled. My problem with that is going to be that last half of the week. So we find this in the book of revelation. Now the critics will, they'll, they'll general, generally, they don't want to hear it. But I think that most evangelicals, uh, whether they be pre-mill or whether they be preterist, would agree that the 42 months mentioned in the book of Revelation do have something to do with Daniel's 70 weeks. So I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, this is the last half of Daniel's 70th week. So this had to have either happened in the first century, which would mean the, paru pa the parousia happened in AD 70, or it would have to be future. I don't think there's any other options. And I've had people, you know, come on my program to discuss um, you know, Daniel's 70th week. I don't see any other options. Now you could do as John Lightfoot did and say, well, the 70 weeks ended on the cross and that's what brought in everlasting righteousness. That's what the, you know, but it's gotta be either at the first coming or at the second coming. I don't think there's any way to explain it any other way. Um, and that's where I come from. And I understand the other views that are out there. I understand, you know, the stoning of Steve and I understand, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes. I understand those views and I've, I've fielded those views, but I, you know, my best judgment is that the pre nicenes were correct and that there's going to be a last week of seven year period at the end of the, at the end of the Adamic age. And that's going to be where those 42 months fit in. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I just, I, I didn't really know too much what to think of it, but I was just thinking of the poetic element. The fact that it's 70 AD just seemed yeah. so interesting, I guess, uh, considering all of the different prophetic elements. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, I, I definitely wasn't a hundred percent sure what to expect in our debate because you do, you have this huge plethora of different views <laughs> and so it was like wait, wait wait what do you think here and here and um yeah so some of these things and i wasn't exactly sure which arguments uh you were going to go into so one i want to bring up because it it was just on my mind because it didn't come up in during our debate but i was uh wondering about it so you hold to the uh literal bodily reign of christ right Yes. And one of the arguments that you make for this, and I've seen it a little bit from some others, but I felt like it's worth exploring and talking about a little bit here, is you bring up the idea of kind of typologically connecting this with Adam back from Genesis, and that Adam doesn't actually reign for a thousand years, but dies, I think, as 930. And so Christ is going to be the bodily fulfillment of that and reign for a thousand years. Is, did I articulate that correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly what I think. I, um, and I don't remember where I, I don't remember where I picked that up. I picked it up. You know, this is anything that I give you is going to be usually 90% of, of, of some theologians that I've read in 10% me. So this isn't something that I just conjured up, but I, I can't remember where I got that from. There's a gentleman that was on my show and he comes on every once in a while. His name is Carmine Hetrick. I think I might've picked it up from him. And he said at one, in one of the interviews I did with him, he said that Christ's, that the millennium is Christ's full millennium is counter, counter, counterbalances Adam's impart, uh, partial millennium. And so now he's not a premillennialist, so he thinks that the millennium is is means it means forever. 
So Christ's going to reign forever while Adam only reigned 930 years. Well, I started thinking about it and I said, well, you know, I think that's actually a great doctrine, but I think the thousand is going to be, you know, is going to be a thousand years. That's pretty much my position. And I tie that in. I try to tie that in with some of the, the early church, you know, theology like Irenaeus, Lactantius, where they talked about the six six days, you have solar days and you have redemptive days. And so even, you know, even the author of second Peter, when he says a day is as a years, a thousand years is one day. Um, you know, I think that lends a lot of support to perhaps the idea of there being a redemptive week in addition to a solar week. Um, it, is it something that I can dogmatically insist on? No, of course not. It's all inferential, just like many other doctrines that we believe are inferential. But it's something that I believe because I think, I think it best answers those those, those scriptures and the evidence that we have. That whether I'll change my opinions in the future is a different story. But that's where I that's where I'm leaning now. That's one thing I, I certainly won't hold you to your your views forever. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it reminds me actually of somebody else who actually posited this as the suggestion as to they were trying to reconcile the Genesis 2 issue of like, in the day you eat of it, you will die. And they actually reference this idea of a day is as a thousand years and Adam doesn't live to be a thousand years. So therefore, Adam does die in that day, so to speak. Um, I think that's sort of interesting. I mean, to be blunt, I, I don't. Uh, hold that view. I don't, I don't necessarily agree that that's what God is saying, but, right. but just further interesting typology in, in reference to the ideas that you're, you're espousing. So. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you know, yeah, Genesis three will, and will, you know, um, you're going to come out on my channel next week. So we'll, you know, you could discuss your, your views on that. That's a totally different, um, you know, I have some views on Genesis three as well. That's a totally different, different discussion that would take, that would take all night. We could we could discuss Genesis three all night long and probably just just <laughs> scrape the surface. That's how much how much depth there is in in that chapter. Totally true. Totally true. So yeah, <laughs> I don't want to yeah use our time here. We'll we'll get the chance to discuss that. So uh, yeah, in the future, I'm looking forward to that too. That'll be fun. So here what we've got with this the other major thing. So I'm not e I'm not even sure. Do you even have a title? What what is your view? I don't, because I don't even know how to describe because you're like, okay, well, you're pre historic pre mill. Maybe we should define that first. What's the difference between historic pre mill and dispensational pre mill? Because today, all pre mill is is left behind. Left behind is pre mill. And yeah. if you don't believe left behind, well, you're not a pre millennialist. Right. I think, I think, Adam, I think it's all going to boil down to ecclesiology. And so there's this is the this is the problem is I've been studying even among premillennial writers there's this great spectrum of different views and I don't think mm -hmm. people really realize because a lot of it is grassroots um, and it's not academic or scholastic a lot of people like say in the scholastic academic world don't realize how much variety there is among premillennialists because there's well it's never come into the academy it's never <laughs> it's never hit the, the you know the the, the stacks at, at, at the uh, at, at the seminary library so they don't know what the views are out there but um, ultimately, it's going to boil down to ecclesiology. And so ecclesiology, the dispensational ecclesiology insists that Israel is distinct from the church. Um, and so, so ultimately, a, a historic a premillennialist is going to say that um, the Israel and the church are not distinct, that the church actually is uh, the ideal Israel, the spirit, spiritual Israel, Israel of God, into which Gentiles are, are grafted onto an already existing uh, Jew, uh, Gen, um, Jewish stock. And so instead of uh, the church being a new thing that was never predicted in the Old Testament, there is some, uh, the, the historic premillennials will more often than not uh, insist that, that the church was actually predicted in the Old Testament by means of these promises that Israel was going to be blessed. Now, have we seen all of those blessings um, you know, yet do we see those blessings happening now? Well, some of them we do, some of them we don't, but in, and there's differences as to, as to what elements are going to be fulfilled and what elements aren't. 
But every, almost every historic premillennialist I've talked to is going to insist that Israel and the church are pretty much the same. Now, Israel under the old covenant is a dis, some different bird than Israel under the new covenant. So I believe that I believe that Israel was flipped to the new covenant on the day of Pentecost. And so, you know, when you flip something to the, you know, from, from it being under the flesh to being under the spirit, things change, right? And so a Jew becomes one who, who's no longer in the flesh, but who, who's in the spirit. Um, circumcision becomes no longer something that's, uh, that takes place in the flesh. It takes place in the heart. And so Israel gets flipped. And then the true Jews become those who from among the Jews um, accept Jesus Christ. And they are the nucleus of the new generation which enters the land at the end of the wilderness period. So remember the 40-year the wilderness period, uh, they were brought out of Egyptian bondage. They were called to a, um, a, uh, to a land of freedom and, and blessing. But that generation that came out under Moses, they never made it. Uh, Moses never made it. Uh, Aaron never made it. The Levi you know, Levitical priesthood never made it. Well, the priests made it, but Aaron didn't. And so, um, so the generation that enters the land is the new generation, and they they get to, they get to partake of the promises. And so, I think this is a this is really the centerpiece. If I had to give you the centerpiece of my eschatology, would be that forty years and the fact that the old uh, the old Israel after the flesh did not make it. They died in the wilderness. They didn't receive the promises, but the new generation that was in the spirit. They entered the land in AD 70, and now they constitute, that's the church, and the church, now we're in the land uh, the land conquest period. And so we're not in the wilderness anymore, we're in the land conquest period. That means we can win victories. That means we can we can take over the world, not in a bad sense, but that means we can win the world for Christ <laughs> yeah. if we if we do it right, if we if we if we're obedient, just as the Israelites had to be obedient to Moses when they entered the land, or they would they would lose. They would lose battles. They would lose territory, etc. Same thing with the church after AD 70. If we're obedient to Christ, we win victories. If we're not obedient, we suffer defeat. And this is, this is historically confirmed by the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, as long as they were preaching the, the gospel, um, and of course they mixed it with other things, but as long as they were preaching the actual gospel and teaching the commands of Christ and teaching the, the words of the Apostle Paul and reading scripture— uh, and leading people into the ways of righteousness, they won victory. They won. They won Europe. They they had the control of all Europe. And then, of course, when they had become so corrupt that they that they were no longer even anything that thing uh, like the the Church of the uh, the Apostolic period, then that's when they lost all of their political power. Same thing with the Eastern Orthodox Church. They, um, you know, the 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 the, the Muslims. Uh, took over uh, those areas which were formerly uh, ruled over by the, um, you know, by the patriarchs and whatnot, and they kicked them out of Constantinople, and they lost a lot of territory as well. This comes after the Seventh Ecumenical Council with their idolatry and their images and icons and all that. And so it's a, it's a valid principle. Land's conquest is a valid principle. I think we saw a piece of it, and I'm not going to ask you your political views or anything. And I you know, advertise for 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 um, for Trump or for Republicanism or anything. But I think we saw a little bit of that just in this last election here in the U.S., where you had a great mass of people come out, and you had a lot of people on their knees as well, praying for God to do something. And you had a lot of people, um, you know, really, um, uh, you know, obeying Jesus Christ in a way that perhaps they haven't done before, uh, and. Maybe that maybe that did it, but I think the principle is valid, and I think that's you know that's the best answer I could give you. It's a roundabout answer. It's it's exhaustive, but that would have to be the centerpiece right there. Well, you know, th those are some aspects that I really agree with. Is the, is the sense in which we should be taking territory and taking land, you know, and that's mm -hmm. something that I think is very powerful. And one of the things that I stand on concerning America, anyway, is that I absolutely believe America was a Christian nation. You know, now you can talk about like, oh, is it still today? But you know what? I think undeniably, in the past, it was a Christian nation, and especially when you look at the world as a grand scope and you talk to people from other parts of the world, they're all going like, yeah, of course America is a Christian nation. And I just don't think that a country has to have a religion as their official, you know, 
I don't know, official statements or writings. It doesn't have to be in there for a nation to be Christian or not Christian. You know, when we look at several other nations, we know it's like, oh, this is an Islamic nation. This is a Hindu nation. This is an atheistic nation. Why? Because we understand the governing principles that dominate that society, that government. And so I think that I'll actually, I'll just never forget Gary Kasparov. Gary Kasparov, I don't know if you know who he is, uh, but you know he was a world chess champion, and uh, today he's a Russian politician, and he's been trying to unseat Putin for years. But um, when Bush was president, he came on to one of those talk shows, and they're talking to him and everything like that, and he said, you know, America used to be the light. They were a beacon of hope that everyone else wanted to be. Everyone else wanted to be like America. And I think that he was correct. And I just also, I was just, because as far as I know, Kasparov is not a Christian guy. He's not a religious man. But the imagery that he portrayed in talking about America and how he felt like America looked to the rest of the world was that of Jesus, right? It was, it was exactly like what Israel was supposed to be, right? They, they created a world in which, you know what? Many people were Christians, and people fight about like, oh, they're just religious. It's like, okay, if you visit the other parts of the world and then you come back to America, you'll understand how incredibly Christian American culture was, how, how incredibly free, how much you can talk about God, talk about Jesus. The fact that we have any of those things is, um, yeah, it just incredible. And we do, we need to continue to change the world for Christ. Yeah, so. I agree. So um, you would say, for clarity's sake then, that Israel is not something that should be awaiting a promise or fulfillment as far as the nation state goes. Or do you still believe that there are promises that God will fulfill to the nation state and that Christians across the globe should be looking towards Jerusalem? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so, I think I think it's safer to say that the Jews are still will play play a factor. How I see it, Adam, is I see the um, if you go back to Paul's um, analogy of the olive tree, what I see happening is that the Jews are being the the natural branches are being cut off in AD seventy, and so. I think he's drawing his imagery from, I think it is Jeremiah chapter 11, where it talks about the same thing about the branches being cut off. And of course, Jeremiah is talking about an upcoming Babylonian invasion. Well, that is when they lost their political uh, headship. And then they lose their religious headship in AD 70. So at some level, Paul mm -hmm. also, he, I think he quoted Habakkuk in reference to, um, to a um, to an upcoming uh, catastrophe. Well, Habakkuk had already quoted in reference to the Babylonians. So there is there is a doctrine, there is a a parallel, I think, in the, in Scripture in the prophets, which sees a sort of a twofold cutting off for Israel. So, I, I what I'm what I'm seeing is the Jews being grafted back in at the end of the age. Um, mm -hmm. And being grafted back into the church, obviously, because I think it was their church to begin with. There were 12, 12 Jewish apostles. And then, of course, it passed, the calling passed over to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are grafted in. And then at the end of the age, I think the Jews are going to, there's going to be a, a, um, an influx of Jews back into the church. As far as the nation state of Israel goes, I personally believe, and I'm going to give you my personal my personal. Um, approach to this and this is somewhat controversial my personal approach is that to the to the modern nation state is it's the rebuilding of jericho by ahab and jezebel remember now when israel entered the land those mm -hmm. trumpets started to sound and jericho fell well later on uh ahab and jezebel it was an apostate jew gentile alliance later on they ended up rebuilding it and so what happens in AD 70 after the church <laughs> enters the land, or right at that time, Jerusalem falls. And centuries later, they end up rebuilding them. We know that it wasn't, if you look back at the scriptures and you look at, say, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 10, which is basically it's the restoration, the great restoration passage of, of, of the five books of Moses, where it talks about if you repent 
and turn to Christ, uh, turn to turn to God, ye will bring you back into the land. Well, this was a, a bringing back into land without any repentance whatsoever. So I, I question whether or not this was actually related to Bible prophecy. Now, I know that dispensationalism says it was, but I question that. And I think that's one of the errors of, of dispensationalism. Dispensationalism has created this sort of has turned the nation state of Israel into almost a fetish where now you have to be, you know, they expect you to be, it's almost a hyper philo Semitic view where you have to be, you can't even criticize anybody who's, <laughs> who's, who's, mm -hmm. oh, you can't criticize anybody who's Jewish. You can't criticize anybody who's, you know, if you do that, you're, you're against God's people. Well, that's not yeah, the way yeah. the prophet, the prophets never had, had that understanding. Um, you know, this is, so yeah, I don't think, I think this is uh, one of the dispensational um, mistakes that they've made. And I think restoring Israel to its proper place as a covenant people of God was under the old covenants, under the new covenant. It's the same nation, but it's, it's a spiritual seed now. It's no longer a natural seed. So yeah, you're going to be some Jews, you're going to be some Gentiles. And incidentally, and I think Steve Gregg brought this out in one of his debates, it was also, they took Gentiles under the old covenant too. They had to be uh, they had to be uh, mm -hmm. circumcised before they could partake of the Passover. But same thing with us. We have to be circumcised in heart before we can partake of Christ's the uh, Christ's Passover, the true Passover, uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ. So it's the same thing. But yeah, I don't, I don't buy the. Um, I, I guess I don't buy the the propaganda about about Israel, about the nation state of Israel. Yeah, and that's really where. I kind of push back because I, I am, I've seen lots and lots of Christians. They are just sold out for Israel and almost just doesn't matter what Israel does. And my response to a lot of them, it, cause they're all just like, Oh, is the end coming and the rapture coming? And it's all the, all this stuff. And I mean, I've heard even people like, Oh, it's going to happen during my lifetime. It's going to happen. I mean, <laughs> like I was talking to you a little bit before the show, you know, one of the reasons I like you is cause I don't consider you a wacko. And That's I was nice. in this other space, <laughs> this other space where, you know, this dude, he's written his book and he's proclaimed that the Antichrist is Prince Charles of Wales and that like he's, they've got all down to the nitty gritty and all this stuff. And I literally was just like, look, this is nonsense. Like, what, like, this is just false. Like, and I was trying to convince a few people, but you know, most people are just super, super sold in. But the main thing for me is that, yeah, as I look at Israel and people are like, Israel, 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 I don't think there's anything wrong with cheering on Israel, but I won't really be that sold on everything until Israel submits to Christ. Like to me, it's just apparent that it's like, hey, look, cool. Is Israel devoted to Christ? Have they turned themselves back to God? And is that a reality for the nation of Israel. And I hear a lot of great stories that more and more of the Jewish people are coming to Christ. And that's wonderful. But um, I'm not exactly going to be celebrating and pushing Israel to the fullest extent until, yeah, like I feel like, yeah, Israel is, they've turned to God and Christ really is king in Israel. And I think that will be really interesting. If Christ becomes king in Israel and dominates the nation state, that'll be quite something to see. Now there is a another typology that I'm really curious to hear what you think about regarding this aspect because somebody else brought it up to me and I actually find it very compelling and they said view the story of Joseph in an eschatological framework. And yeah. I really instantly kind of got what they were talking about and regarding Israel it reminds me exactly of that right if you view Joseph as Christ right and he's so to speak what he's thrown in a pit so he sort of dies in, in a metaphorical sense and then he's sold into slavery to another nation and what's he do he ends up making that nation another nation outside of the tribe of Israel into a glorious kingdom right so there's another kingdom and then it's not till way later, right, that the Jewish people, they come and they see him and they don't recognize him, right? They don't even recognize him. They're kind of blinded by it all and they don't realize that he is the one whom they had tried to kill. And ultimately, eventually, right, their eyes are opened and realize this is their brother, Right. And so it's not until after that. And so that I found very interesting viewing in light of all of the eschatology and the possibility that, you know what, at some point down the road, 
Israel may wake up and say, yeah, we had it wrong. Jesus is king. Jesus is the the one we were looking for, our promised Messiah. Yeah, I agree. I think that is actually... Um... One of the texts that I've used before to to um, to uphold the doctrine of a future uh, return of the Jews to, through through repentance, of course, back to God. So, um, you know, this is where I think the seven week the seven years comes in. Uh, you know, when we talk about seven years, now the Jews, if you if you if you believe Gill, because he he didn't often cite his sources exhaustively, like say a modern academic would, but John Gill wrote a, a commentary on the new. Uh, Testament, and I think it might have been in either Matthew 24 or Luke 21, he mentioned the sorrows of the Messiah. It's this period that the Jews thought was going to happen at the, during the last seven years of the age. There was going to be a period called the sorrows of the Messiah. And so they have this last week at the end of the right, at the end of the age. They said, well, Christ is going to come in the last, I believe it's the last year. I think maybe it might be the seventh year. And so to me, that's one of the, one of the, um, one of the Old Testament types, which I think could be used to 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 um to show what what really happened in the first century when you start getting into the gospel narratives in the book of Acts, and then ultimately how it all ends in New Testament prophecy is the is the story of Joseph. Story of Moses as well, because remember Moses came to his brethren, uh, he had a first coming where they rejected him, and then he fled to Egypt. Same with um, well, very similar with, with Joseph, but then his second coming when he was <laughs> 40 years later, he actually came with miraculous powers and they accepted him. And so he didn't do any miracles the first time, but he, you know, he did them afterwards. Now, I'm not sure if that has anything to do with the typology or not, but, um, you know, Mos Moses and Joseph are those two Old Testament types, which justify the doctrine of, of, of a, dual, a dual advent of Jesus Christ, because if you read the Old Testament prophets, there's not really anything in specific that says there's a Messiah is going to come twice. It says, well, if you read them in their natural, um, in their context, and just you know, as you would any normal literature, you see, well, they're okay. He's going to come. He's going to bless Israel. He's going to purge out all the non-elect or all the wicked from among from among Israel. He's going to judge the nations. Uh, Israel's going to be blessed. He's going to restore them. And then it's going to be the new heavens and new earth, which is presumably going to go on forever and ever and ever. Um, this kind of, this is different from what we see happening in the new Testament where Jesus Christ comes and uh, he, he basically, you know, the kingdom of heaven is in the hand, it's a hand, it's a hand. And then he gets cut off and then he goes back to heaven. And I think not to get too deeply into topology, but we have the stories of Joseph as uh, David as well with David having to flee um, after Absalom takes over and he flees over, over um, uh, the, the river Jordan, he takes place, I believe in a, a small town uh, called Maenam and they, they receive him. And, but you know, Absalom's reigning in Jerusalem, but David, he's outside of Jerusalem. And then afterwards he comes back after the slaughter of, um, of Absalom, which I take to be a type of, uh, of Armageddon. He comes back and that's when Israel receives him. So there's that too. There's topology. I love topology. And that's one of the things that I've been focused on for many, many years is looking at all the types and trying to make sense of them. It must be your Catholic influence. Yeah, it may be. It may be, man. It's, it's, um, it's certainly something that I think, you know, when I read some really good books, when I was in the, I read some great books, um, you know, written by simple Bible believing Christians that focused heavily on topology. So that's probably some of it too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, now just for clarity, you would agree that typology can go too far, right? Okay. All right. <laughs> topology. Well, topology is open. I think, and this is one of the reasons why I say it's poo pooed in academia is because it, it's subject. There's a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of skullduggery. Um, in, in topology, it's, you know, if there's something in, of course, if you read the standard hermeneutical textbooks, they'll tell you, well, nothing can be a type that isn't explicitly brought out and, you know, is declared to be a type. Now, I don't mm -hmm. believe that's necessarily true. And not all scholars mm -hmm. hold that view. Now, if you go with the post mills, say with your James Jordans or your Peter Lighthearts, 
uh, they will they will be very strongly against it. Say, hey, look, topology. We get a lot of our doctrine from topology. And so, while I'm not post millennial, I appreciate people like James Jordan and Peter Lightheart because they do they will say, hey, you know, this topology is important. We can't understand the scriptures apart from topology, and topology can actually help to dismantle a lot of these critical academic, um, you know, uh, views um, that are out there. So, well, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament are completely unrelated. The New Testament has nothing to do with the Old Testament. Well, if if topology is true, if these types are true, like think of the story of, of Abel, where Abel kills his brother and then he's banished from the land. Uh, I'm sorry, but that's, that's a, you know, that was that's a dead ringer for what happened in the first century. I mean, I don't know. I don't see any way to get around that. Um, so that was something somebody, if that was all made up stuff, then somebody had to know, had to go back to Genesis and, you know, and make the two fit. But this actually historically happened. I mean, 80, 70 happened. We know that. So I think topology is a game changer, but it's also, there's a lot of it's open to a lot of speculation and a lot of skullduggery. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that is where, yeah, it, it can go too far, but I do think it, yeah, I do think that it's justified to, to pay attention to some of the scriptures and some of the imagery to me just seems so strong that even if it's not mentioned by the new Testament apostles, it's just like, look, this is, this is just compelling. I, I have a hard time not seeing it there. And, you know, like you're talking about the Cain and Abel story, I very much feel like yeah, that that is exactly what's going on uh, with John when he's talking about the, the saints crying out for, you know, vengeance for their blood. I, I think that that story of Cain and Abel should be ringing in your ears. You know, it's just the idea of the martyrs, the blood of the martyrs cries out for redemption. And so even though John doesn't mention Cain and Abel by name, he uses lots of imagery from Genesis three and four. And so I think that those are just strong connections that it's like, Hey, cool. Like, look, even if it's not explicitly mentioned, I, I I'm a believer and well, I'm not Catholic, so I don't have to rely on the church alone to decide what is okay and not okay to interpret. And yeah, it just seems like a very powerful, um, powerful image. So with all of that, what do you think about the most important subject that everybody actually wants to know? The Antichrist. I, I can't tell you how much time is spent on the Antichrist, for which probably most Christians actually don't really have any real <laughs> education on, uh, yeah. but still holds such an interest and intrigue for people. Right. Well, speaking of the Antichrist, and I'm going to be – you know, I'm going to take this from probably the preterist perspective first, because I know that that when we we talk about the Antichrist, we have to be able to define well, we have to be able to use the language, say, if there's language of scripture to back that. So there is language in, I believe it's John's first epistle, which talks about Antichrist. It is talking about, uh, you know, little children. It is the last hour. And there are many antichrists. So he's talking about the last hour. I believe he's talking about the last hour of the that dispensation, which was the Mosaic dispensation. It was running out. And he said, now there are many antichrists. And then he identifies antichrist as one who denieth the father and son. So he wasn't talking about Muslims. He wasn't talking about Buddhists. He wasn't talking about, I don't even think he was talking about, um, you know, Christians say today, Unitarians who deny the father and the son. He was talking about the material that he had at hand in his own day, which would have been the, either the Jewish unbelievers or the Jewish apostates. So Antichrist, are you saying, you saying you don't just walk around calling Unitarians antichrists? No, I, I don't, you know, I, I personally, you know, I'm a Trinitarian, but I listen, you know, I listen to, to all kinds of different theology, um, and I've had some some discussions with Unitarians before, but no, I um I, I wouldn't call Unitarian Antichrist, but you could call him. I mean, if you wanted to press the biblical def definition, I guess you could. But the way I see Antichrist is, and if you want to tie this in with Revelation 13 about the two beasts, is I think it all goes back to Christ. And I think Christ is the template for understanding that passage because in his own in his own ministry, in his own body. 
um, he had um, he had the Jew, uh, the Gentile uh, political leader colluding with the uh, the Jewish religious leaders to put him to death. And so how I see this playing out is um, ultimately at the end of the age, at uh, the end of the Adamic age, there's going to be a persecuted remnant, if you will. And it's going to be the body, the body of Christ in its last, very last um, eschatological uh, phase of development. And there's going to be a Gentile political leader who's going to collude with the Jewish religious leader to, to persecute Christians. And that's really as far as I take it. Now, if you want to get into the patristics and, and get it, you know, Hippolytus and, um, you know, Irenaeus and all those guys, one of the things I found is that a lot of the, the, um, the, uh, the patristics, and especially this is go, goes into Protestant theology as well, will identify Antichrist as, say, the first beast, is there's not really a, cl a clear definition of who the Antichrist is. They'll say, well, you know, the first beast, the beast from the sea, they'll say, well, that's Antichrist, or the, the little horn, that's Antichrist. Well, well then what about the, the false prophet? And I think it was suggested by, here's where I would agree with, say, some of the early dispensationalists who pointed out that the Antichrist is actually the second beast. It's actually the Jewish polit the Jewish Jewish religious leader who's an Antichrist because he denies the Father and the Son, colluding with the Gentile political leader to persecute the Christians. Probably gonna be Jewish Christians that are being persecuted um, by uh, by the uh, the rabbinical uh, Jews of, of their day. But it's something, again, this is something that, you know, it's my opinion. I have to use qualifying language. Like I think perhaps probably my opinion, and this is not something that I would say, well, here's, you know, this is, this is something that I'm going to teach. I'm gonna make videos and sell them for 1995. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, you know, there's, it's, 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 it's my opinion on what I think the scripture's teaching, but antichrist is someone who denies the father and the son, someone who I think was, there were many of them. They were on the scene in the first century. I don't think he's talking about the 21st century, but doesn't mean there can't be a, you know, a dual fulfillment. I think that there's great theologians who have seen that, you know, that there is sort of a dual fulfillment going on where, you know, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. So everything that happened at the end of the, um, at the end of the uh, mosaic dispensation is going to be mirrored by certain parallel things that happen at the end of the Adamic dispensation. I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. See, that is a mistake that I feel like some of the ah mills and post mills make is, is to say like, well, look, you know, that's already passed. And they might take just a partial preterist view and say that like, Oh, the antichrist was officially embodied in Nero. And therefore there will be no future fulfillment. There is no antichrist. There is none of this other stuff. And I'm very much open to the possibility because I just don't really feel like there is any reason to close the door on that. And there just seems like there is so much room for it to happen and still be to me completely in line with the Bible. I, I just don't feel like there is any contradiction. If you say that, yeah, Nero was a type of antichrist and that there is in the future, some other leader shows up and happens to do and perform all of these other things. I, I just don't feel like, I, I guess it's probably one of the strongest things I would say is like, I don't feel like there is any contradiction in claiming those things. Like there's no inherent biblical contradiction. And so therefore I don't feel like there's any reason for me to be dogmatic in that way. And yeah, I, I feel like it, th there's a lot of reasons that there's so much imagery that yeah, other things could happen. And I do wonder, like, do you take when Paul talks about the man of lawlessness right? He says, we have to wait till the man of lawlessness appears. Do you take that as a final eschatological statement? Or do you also take this to be referring to Nero or something like that? Because I know in this case, you didn't really mention too much about that, but I feel like you had some particular beliefs concerning Nero and how it related to 70 AD. So if you could flesh a little bit of that out, I'd love to hear. Yeah. Um, uh, so second Thessalonians, I think that he was writing about, it was probably Claudius who was restraining you know, the man of sin, I think the man of sin was Nero, but he was, um, the ingredients were there for him to become the beast. And of course that never happened. So one of the, one of the, one of the things that may have surprised you about our debate was here. I am a, a, um, 
a historic premillennialist, right? So I'm premillennial. And here I am pushing the view that Revelation was written in AD 68. The reason why I believe it was written in AD 68 is because if you go back to that list of to that um that line of kings that's spoken of in um in Revelation chapter 17, he says, you know, five are five are fallen and one is, and the other has not yet come. Well, you have to count from the emperors. Now, I know there's there's different views that, that okay, those aren't really kings, and those are, you know, I know I know that there's different views. But if I'm going to go by a more critical academic way of looking at the text, which I try to, and I don't, you know, agree with everything that that academics say, but I try to inform myself of what's being said by by all possible parties, so I have an informed approach. And the most informed interpretation that I've read of that book is that there was a um, there was a le- well, I don't want to call it a legend, but there was a belief within the Roman Empire shortly after Nero died. And we could read this in Suetonius at the end of his life of Nero. I think it's in the last paragraph. They thought that Nero was going to return. In fact, some scholars believe that he was going to return at the head of an army of Parthian horsemen. He was going to come from the east. He was going to cross the river Euphrates and he was going to raise, raise Cain. Um, and and create a, another persecution. So when this book was written, I think that they had already gone through the Neronic persecution. The churches had remembered the, the horrors of that that um, of what had happened. You know, they remembered Antipas being being uh, martyred, uh, and they were getting a little bit of respite from persecution. But they were starting to grow spiritually dull. And so what John's doing was Paul's off, Paul's off the scene. He had to, he had been martyred, and so John's taking over his missionary circuit for a season. Now, why he was in why he was in Patmos is how he says it's for the word of God. It doesn't specifically say that he was persecuted by Nero, although there's a tradition in the Syriac version, the superscription says that he was sent there by Nero. So the Syriac version is, is and you probably already know this, but for the, for the benefit of your listeners, um, your viewers, the Syriac version is the oldest extant version of the apocalypse. And it says there's a superscription that says, um, written by John, when he was on the island of Patmos, to which he had been sent by the Emperor Nero. So I think he was sent there by the Emperor Nero, and Nero probably died shortly thereafter. John was running a missionary circuit. He was trying to fulfill Paul's missionary circuit, and he was writing of visions that he had seen about Nero being rising from the dead and returning as the eighth of the seven. So the eighth is the same, it's the same, it's one of those seven that's resurrected. Because remember, eight is the number of resurrection, and then the eighth becomes the beast. And so uh, there's quite a bit of scholarly literature that puts Revelation written during the reign of Galba, which would have been the one that is. He only reigned for, I think, a few months. But it, this is spread out over a lot of of material and there's some of the materials hard to find some of the materials in German. Um, there was a book published in the fifties. I forget the man's name. I think it might've been Collins. He wrote a commentary on revelation. That's extremely difficult to find, but Robert Gundry, one of the great new Testament scholars, he writes in his book of revelation. He recognizes this position. I've got a book. Uh, I've got a book here by, um, by Merrill Tenney. It's actually a very popular book. It just gives an outline on Revelation and gives some different views, but it also references that Nero read a vivis view as a possible um, possibility. Now, what the full preterists will, or what the full, well, full and partial preterists say, and I think they spoil the argument, is they realize, well, if this was written in AD 68, then obviously Nero wasn't, wasn't raised from the dead. He was dead. And then what happened to the 42 months? There wasn't time enough for the 42 months to be fulfilled. And so what they have to do is they have to take that line of kings, uh, that those seven kings, and they have to backtrack them to Julius Caesar. Well, if you ask any, you know, any historian, even if you Google it, find out who the first emperor was, well, it sure wasn't Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a dictator. He never wore the crown in the Republic. Um, Actually, the um, yeah, the Republic didn't come to an end until the Battle of Actium. But what they need they need to do that because they need to fit that that forty two months, that three and a half years into a time frame 
which uh, which gives it enough time for all those prophecies to be fulfilled before 8070. So it's actually it's a very dishonest way of dealing with the text, but they'll all tell you that Revelation was written, say, AD 66. Some will tell you about AD 65. But I believe the answer is in the book itself. If you simply start from Augustus, you have a line of emperors ending with, um, well, ending with what I guess would have been Otho, <clears throat> Otho or Vitellius. But see, this is the thing that the um, the gematria, and you probably know this as well, the gematria actually does give um, in the Hebrew, if you calculate the, the name Neron Caesar, uh, it does mm -hmm. actually, or I think it's Neron Kaiser. I forget the actual, you know, the actual English, English spelling. It actually gives you Nero, the emperor Nero. And Robert Gundry in his New Testament commentary actually comes out and says it. And he actually says that the emperors have to start from Augustus. So I don't see how there's any way around it. But my my only caveat would be is not to think that the prophecy was actually fulfilled because I, I think it was dependent on what that 144,000 first fruits number being sealed. That was the offering that was needed in order to trigger the eschaton. And that's a totally different story. That number failed. Uh, and it failed by divine design. It wasn't a plan B. Uh, God had the first had to fail so the second could be established. Another story, but that's what I think about that. Yeah, so you don't think it was Prince Charles of Wales? The Gematria doesn't paint that out, that it was Prince Charles of Wales? Last last Gematria, last calculation I heard that was in any way plausible was Bill Clinton, and that was a long, <laughs> I think... <laughs> Yeah, I think that was too long ago. I don't think he fulfilled it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's exactly like that's why, yeah, some of these other people I just think are, are I nuts think, and I think they were halfway tempted to say Hillary, but the numbers didn't match up. <laughs> didn't match up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh man. Yeah, there's uh so much for all of that. Um, yeah, so I, I, I very much um, appreciate a lot of that stuff. Now, I, I do want to know what your response is to some of the major objections, because, of course, the dating of Revelation is very contested today. And the big objection is that the book of Revelation wasn't written prior to 70 AD at all, but rather that it was written, uh, I think it's in the 90s. I think it's in the 90s. And they take this based on the, um, the writings of Ignatius. Hold on. Irenaeus, Irenaeus, right? It's Irenaeus who states something about it being written in the 90s. Now, I've heard a little bit of Ken Gentry and some others who have all been talking about and arguing about this. And so I am curious, how do you respond to those who are like, look, Irenaeus clearly says the book is written much later. So therefore, that settles it. Your All of your points and all your arguments, Brian, amount to nothing. Well, I think if, let's just put it this way, um, if the book was written in the 90s, that would be, that would be the, the most, um, that would be probably the best argument, the most effective argument against preterism that you could, you could even think of. But I don't, yeah. I don't know exactly what it would be teaching. What's it supposed to be teaching if it was written in the 90s? You know, behold, I'm coming quickly. He's talking about things that he thought were going to happen soon. Remember, and quickly, um, mm -hmm. and, and Takai. I think is the is the Greek and it means with speed. So he's not talking about things that are that are right that are extending over like a long period of time, like say the historicists would would claim that this is taking place. This is a, a this is a prophetic foreview of the of the church age. It's talking about something that's compressed into a, I believe, a three and a half year period. So the things that have to come to pass soon. That's one that's one of the questions that I would ask that I would put on the table in answering that question prior to previous to answering that question is well what's it supposed to be teaching if you put it in a 95 time frame and what is the what was the potential fulfillment what would the potential fulfillment have looked like because it doesn't if the potential fulfillment if you can gauge what it looked like prior to 8070 you got some things that match up. You've got Nero, you've got the neuronic persecution, you've got the destruction of Jerusalem, you've got the, the, uh, the you know, um, uh, the, um, the city of Jerusalem being destroyed. So you have at least some things that you can line up and say, well, even if it wasn't all fulfilled, at least we see a lot of potential fulfillment during that time frame. 
But with 80, 95, you don't really have that. Now, as far as Irenaeus goes, I believe his exact wording was, he said that the book, he said he, either he or it was seen no long time ago. And the question is whether he's referring to the book uh, Revelation or he, John. And that's been a common, um, that's actually been a common, a common objection, I think. If I have it here, well, I don't know what I did with it, but there's a um, there's a commentary by Young who translated the commentary, a uh, Young's commentary on the um, on the uh, <clears throat> or actually Young's translation of the Bible, and he actually came out with an argument that said, you know, what he was doing was he was misnaming. Um, uh, see if I can find misnaming the book as opposed to John. Uh, the person. Yeah, I guess I don't. I'm not for sure that I had it in this in this rack, but it, oh, here it is. So yeah, so basically, let me see if I could find it real quick. So basically, he said that it was written in Patmos about AD 68, whether John had been banished by Domitian Nero, as stated in the title of the Syriac version of the book. And with this concurs the express statement of Irenaeus, uh, who says it happened in the reign of Domitianu, that is Domitianus Nero, Sulpicius Severus, Erosius, and others stupidly mistaking Domitianu for Domitianicos, supposed Irenaeus to refer to Domitian in AD 95, and most succeeding writers have fallen into the same blunder. So it appears that what he was saying was that it was John was seen uh, no long time ago rather than the book, but it's all tradition. And it's, I think the the Nero Redivivus view makes sense. It's it's referenced by Augustine. It was referenced by Sulpicius Severus. Augustine actually wrote in one of his commentaries that it was the view that so many of the early Christians held that Nero was going to come back from the dead. So it's got very strong provenance. It's just what is, again, I would have to ask, you know, what is it, if it was written in AD 95, what is what is it supposed to be teaching? What would the potential, uh, um, what would a potential speedy fulfillment look like during that time frame? Because we don't know, we wouldn't know who the beast was. We wouldn't know, you know, it, it doesn't seem to fit into that time frame. Just going by the the uh, the, the internal evidence itself, let alone the historical evidence, which is open to speculation. Yeah, I know there is a scholar who makes an argument for this, and that I think it's is it is it. Dominicus or Diocletian, he yeah. says that he thinks that that's what it's all referring to. And so now I, unfortunately I can't remember his name, but he has um, a long argument um, as, as to this. And so I, I'm not going to be able to do it justice at all, unfortunately. So, but, um, but yeah, he, so he, he kind of pins this to another leader. And so he actually says that there's another event that takes place that is kind of similar to 70 AD. And so he tries to, to match it up that way. And so that's kind of his argument, but it's always just one that to me has been interesting to me. And I did feel like, yeah, if, if the book of revelation is marked after 70 AD, then I have a hard time making sense of it in preterism. Um, so yeah, I was curious, yeah, how some of the preterists were going to respond to that since it's my understanding that that is today, the mainstream uh, scholastic view is that it, to take the later dating of revelation. But, but I have heard, I've heard really interesting and I feel like really decent arguments talking about as far as the internal consistency of the book and, um, and those things. So it's been very fascinating to me anyway, to listen to kind of the, the arguments back and forth concerning it. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to mention real quick about the scholastic view is, and this is something that I've come across in my own readings is that the scholastics, remember, a lot of these guys don't believe in inerrancy and they don't believe in the predictive value of prophecy. And so it makes sense for them to place it in a time frame where it couldn't possibly happen, you know, it, rather than to place it in a time frame, well, you know, hey, he said he's coming soon. Maybe if, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe the preterists have a point. And so there's a strong among academics, and Sam Frost will tell you this, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you, you know, night and day, uh, that there's a strong tendency away from the supernatural and away from any predictive value of prophecy. Now, I think that there's a lot of uh, value and merit for this view that it was written in AD 68. But would I stand up, can I stand up in, in, um, 
and, and uh, improve it. I don't know. I could debate it if that were if that were open. Uh, if uh, if I were you know asked to debate that subject, I would certainly debate it very strongly, and I think I could win the debate. But as far as you know, when you start getting into scholars, yeah, there's a lot of scholarship that says it was written in 95 AD, but is that really what the evidence points to? I mean, we have to use our own, you know, our own um, judgment as well. We can't just listen to scholars. There's a lot of, there's a lot of other sources we need to listen to. We need to listen to patristics. We need to listen to reformers, post-reformers. Um, it, it goes a lot deeper than, you know, the people that think scholarship has all the answers, uh, well, they have answers, but then the opposite scholars have answers too. And then those guys over there, they've got answers. It's, scholarship is just as, you know, is just as divided as, as orthodoxy. It really is. Here's a bit of a sidetrack, but it's, it's also connected to this. Do you think that there is any potential connection between an antichrist figure and the Islamic, the Islamic Messiah? I don't know if you're familiar with the Islamic eschatology or not. If not, then that's all right. You know, I really haven't studied Islamic eschatology, um, but I've heard about, are you talking about the Mahdi? El Mahdi. Yeah, okay. Um, I don't know. That would be something that I would have to say. I don't really know. I don't think so. Only because, um, you know, the scriptures that I would use as a historic premillennialist to um, to flesh out the Antichrist, show that he comes from uh, he would come from Rome, he would come from uh, uh, you know he would be the revived okay. you know this would be the revived Roman Empire and all that and so I do believe you know Daniel nine it's a very controversial passage where it talks about the people of the prince that shall come and then he will make a covenant and so I do hold that view that you know he is the prince that should come he's coming from the Roman. Um, you know, from the Roman empire, if you will. And so, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't see how that fits in with the idea of an Islamic antichrist, but it would be something mm -hmm. that I would have to study because I don't really know Islam, sure, sure. Islam faith too well. So that's something that I would have to put on the shelf for, for later study. It's, it's, it's worth go look up a five, 10 minute video on it. And it's okay. just, it, it'll be very interesting because you'll just see a bunch of parallels to that of Revelation in that mm. the Al-Mahdi is supposed to come after Islam suffers a mighty blow, and then he will come and help resurrect Islam as if, you know, from defeat. And he will, what, wage war against everyone for seven years. And it is supposed to be at the end of the seven-year term that the great resurrection will occur. And so, yeah, well, I mean, it's possible that, you know, there's a lot of parallels uh, between, um, I would say, between any of the the views, of, you know, that are based on the Bible, simply because of a lot of the topology in the Bible. And then, of course, you had patristics and, and you had the Jewish, the you know, the rabbis and all of them. So, yeah, I will look that up because it sounds interesting. And it could be some of those parallels that we're seeing, um, you know, even with the rabbis will say there's going to, you know, there's going to be a character in the future. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's germane to a lot of the Abrahamic religions simply because they're getting, they're using a common pool, a common source of, of literature. So, yeah. I'll just say it, it was, it was very interesting because I did see enough parallels that I was like, that is compelling. And yeah, so let's, let's dive a little bit almost into some of the conspiratorial aspects. All right. For let's have a little bit of fun. But this would be goes along a little bit with some of those in that it would be the idea that yes, you would have this Islamic leader would rise up and that at some point he will make some sort of alliance with the leader of Israel. And so that would be resonant with this idea of almost a false prophet of one who rises up in Israel, makes an alliance with Islam and they end up basically persecuting most of the world in this regard. So with all of this other stuff, what do you think about the number 666 and the mark of the beast? That is what everyone else wants to know. Will the world go down to a one world currency? And to be blunt, Brian, you know, I, I bring up some of this stuff because it's good for conversation. And, um, and it is, I am curious what you think, but you know, for myself, 
I think that there are good arguments to say like, well, what's to say that the mark of the beast wasn't always, you know, those who oppose Christ, those who are giving into these world systems, you know, for those that don't know, I'm an amillennialist. So I, I take some of this stuff much less literally, but I will also say, I'm not entirely opposed to the possibility that there is some sort of much greater literal manifestation of some of these things in the future. Yeah. Uh, the 666 number, and I follow Irenaeus on this, it's basically it's man's number. It's the concentration of, uh, of man's number of man's dominion. And so you have, of course, you know, if you want to go back to the, you know, the redemptive week, um, you know, you have six days of of uh, of human rule followed by seven a seven day uh the seven days is, is the day of the lord and so at the end of the sixth period is there's this concentration of wickedness and apostasy 666 if you go back to you know goliath i think his the you know six played heavily into his number um and that's the view i hold i mean basically you get i got it right out of irenaeus i don't have anything too fancy to offer in respect to that except that it seems that Looking at it from the aspect of a possible potential future fulfillment, I would have to say that it looks what it looks like to me. You know, if I were to read the text as any perhaps any premillennialist would, what it looks like to me is that it looks like once this this uh, there's going to be some kind of world government that takes over where there's a. It may not be, you know, anything so so fancy as a microchip. But I think the Greek word is karagma. It's almost like an etching, like a cutting. And so it may refer to some kind of a tattoo, may refer to something. It's something whereby you are economically persecuted if you don't take it. So we saw something similar to this, or we saw something that could have been similar to this, say, in the, in the, re, with the recent pandemic, where... Um, you know, people, you know, they, they, there was a talk of at some level of having an ID, having to carry an ID that should sh show that you were vaccinated. And yeah, so it yeah. would be something like that, that we've seen almost take place. It would be something like that on a greatly magnified scale. Perhaps it would be something, maybe, maybe something like a microchip implant. I don't like to get fancy with those views though, because I always, what I always try to do Adam is I always try to put it into a first century context. And I know that's a bummer. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people don't like that. Say, oh, <laughs> you know, that's not fair, darn it. I wanted to this to be, you know, to, to be today. But it wasn't written. It was written mm -hmm. 2000 years ago when it was written in a specific historical construct. So what was, yeah. so the way I would solve that problem, and I haven't really done this, but the way I would typically solve that problem would be, what was what would it, what what would that have looked like under the Roman empires, under the Roman emperors? And that would be something that would take you possibly down the road of a true answer, seeing what they did um, and, and what they their methods of doing it. And there may be some historic parallel that I don't know about. There probably is. But that's something to 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 look at. Definitely. So Brian, if you ever do that, I want to know what it is. I, I have <laughs> never heard that. And no, I'm serious. I've always wondered, like, what did it mean to them in the first century? What, like when, when John writes it in the book of Revelation, what did his immediate audience think that it meant? And I've never actually heard a good answer to that. I'm really surprised, I guess, that somebody hasn't maybe come up with more of an answer. The only answer that I really have heard is more the allegorical one. So yeah, if you ever find, if some, you find like, oh, there was some sort of Roman symbol or something like that, I would be terribly interested. I'd be fascinated to know. Now I've got another typological argument for you that I'm curious what you think. And this one actually I owe to the movie Fahrenheit 451. Have you ever seen that movie? Uh, no, but I read the book. I, I used to read science okay. fiction books when I was growing up. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't read the book, but I saw the movie and during it, they talk about this one aspect of eliminating languages. They've got the evil council sort of sitting around and they are talking about what word are they going to get rid of today? And so one of the things that seemed interesting to me would be, of course, what are the markers before the end of, I don't know, before Christ comes. And it seems to me, it could be quite fitting that one of those is a one world universal language. 
that the world would go back to a universal language and that this would basically be the flip side of the Tower of Babel. That it would be the idea that the Tower of Babel was one world and then the world, of course, divides and their language is confused and that the end times would be the opposite. That the world actually goes back to a one world language um, and that's how everything ends up transpiring. And I think to me, with the advent of AI and technology, I find this to be all the more plausible because people are already talking about, we can use Google Translate for so many things. I've, I've used it now and I am, I'm amazed at how powerful and how potent it can be. You can talk with somebody, you don't know anything about their language and just type it, you know, say to Google, hey, I wanna say this and it will spit out in their language, you know? And so with the possibility of new technology, it doesn't seem that implausible to me. You know, you may be right. I, I haven't really explored that aspect of it, but um, it sounds like something that could happen. And I mean, a lot of people will say that English is the universal language. It's something that's spoken in, in many other countries. I understand that people still have their languages. Um, but I mean, you know, if you talk to, say, somebody from Germany, or someone from Italy, uh, most more often than not, they'll understand English. Um, I, I don't know. I, I try, you know, that's something that I, I would look at, um, one world government, one world, you know, something that has to do with one world. And I just want to say that before, you know, lest I should be overly speculative, I do want to say that I think what would have to happen first before anything like that would have to be like a World War III situation. Because you still have you still have not just languages, but you still have national barriers and nation, you know, nations that are autonomous. Um, and one of the things that I see in scripture um, is a fusing together of, of all of mankind into one homogeneous uh, government. So that's something that would have to take place first, because, you know, in, in this is going back to the wisdom of Irenaeus. He said, if you want to know when, when the, you know, when the second coming is, is, is around the corner, he says, look till, wait till the kingdom is divided into 10. When you see the 10 Kings, then, then, you know, and I sort of take the same approach. I say, look, you know, I'm not looking for a rapture. I'm not looking for, you know, I knew a guy who, you know, said he quit his job because he, he, uh, he thought, felt the rapture was going to come around the corner. And I said, well, if you had read Irenaeus, you wouldn't think that you would say, I'd be waiting for the 10 Kings first. So, that's something that could happen, but I think we need something. There, have to, there would have to be like a World War III scenario. Uh, you know, pray to God that that doesn't happen. I certainly hope it doesn't. But the national centers of the world would have to be broken down. Those national barriers would have to disappear first. And look, you know, there's governments that that, that want precisely that, that want a world government. And maybe that's a move in that direction. But it's, it's more speculative. That's the kind of speculative prophecy that I try to stay away from. I don't talk too much about that. Again, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, what, what, what did the first century think of that? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, yeah. And see, I appreciate that. And like I said, I mean, I'm just kind of, to me, these are some speculative ideas. I don't hold to them super tightly, but they're interesting because like I said, I do see a kind of almost typology of the tower of Babel and yeah. it would be very resonant with a one world government. And then, yeah, if you talk about a one world currency, it's like, okay, well, what would the world look like if you had a one world currency, one world government, one world language, you know, and it's like the world would look very different and uh, the possibilities as to what could happen both for good or for evil are multiplied, I think, exponentially. So I think that that's one of the great weaknesses of a one world government, one world language, is that the ability for mass manipulation and control increases drastically. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. I don't know, I, and I don't wanna, you know, uh, I know this is, you don't want, didn't want me to ask you questions, but what would you think oh, no, of, you um, um, you know, I, I like to look at the topology in, in, in Genesis chapter four, where Cain, after he kills his brother, he's evicted. And then he goes out and he builds a city. And I think it's, I think the name of the city is Enoch. 
And that means it has something to do with teaching and initiation. But we find that he also specialized in uh, metallurgy and I guess what you would call invention. He invented things. He, he, he uh, invented mu musical instruments. So he was kind of involved in entertainment. And he also um, got, got involved in some degree of, of, I guess, judicial harshness by levying you know, hard judicial sentences on people who committed crimes and also poly polygamy. polygamy. Um, and so my theory has always been that what happened in AD 70 was actually the start of this cycle where Cain is driven from the land and he builds a city and then he, he, he deals with manufacture. He deals with music and entertainment and stuff. And then gradually mankind becomes corrupted through this. And that's one of the reasons that brings the flood. Now, there's there's some kind of degree of sexual immorality that we read about the, the sons of God mating with the daughters. I'm not so sure if that's a cover up or not, if that's actually veiled language in, you know, in, in mythological form to cover up the fact that Cain actually brought about the the uh, the flood, actually brought about the corruption of hum humanity. But what would you what do you think? What do you think, because since you mentioned the Tower of Babel, what do you think um, Genesis 4 plays in this? Does it play anything, or are we looking, are we chasing red herrings? Mm, I'm maybe going to be a little bit split on that one. So, like, for example, I mean, to me, if, if you want to really push it on the notion of music and stuff like that, well, to me, it sounds like you're going to really be pushing for the fundamentalist Baptist church that basically says you should have musicless churches and you should only yeah. use your voice because look, you know, the evil guys are the ones who created instruments. So you're going to ban drums, ban guitars, ban all these things. And I know people like that, um, like very literally and very seriously. So um, I don't see that element entirely. There's, this is actually a part of a much bigger conversation that we could have further about this. But I think that to me, what I really see is the advent of violence. So for example, when we get to, um, is it Tubal or Jubal? I think it's Jubal who is talking about the one who makes music and those things. And then yeah. he, a man wounds him and he just says, you know, he kills the man. Right. And he says, any man who does anything to me shall be brought back upon his head 70 times seven. And so I actually feel like part of this statement is what leads into Genesis six. And it's the idea of the advent of an increased violence and that he is a very violent man and expects even more violence and expectation there. And so I do think there is very much a, a strong push for that. And I do think you could probably talk about it a little bit in the sense of licentiousness, looseness of living and stuff. But my only struggle in this context is that I just don't see that much. Like we do see the polygamy. We do see that, but I don't see that much from Cain in particular. And he's the only one that I can think of from there to Genesis six. We don't really see too much further talk about um, promiscuity or sodomy and those types of things like we do see in Sodom and Gomorrah. And yeah. God's big outcry in Genesis six is that of violence because the world had become so violent and corrupt. Um, now, I will also say that I lean towards the fallen angel view of Genesis six. Now I do take some nuances in there. There there's a lot more to talk about, but I do take some nuances. I don't necessarily think, well, there's a bunch of stuff. I don't, I'll, I'll say that I don't believe that hybrid humans was God's primary motivation, but here's an additional thing that isn't really in the Bible. So I'll say that I'm, I'm kind of reading between the lines. And so I'm not going to hold it super tightly, but it's this we see this explosion of evil and wickedness during Genesis six. And what that does remind me of is it does remind me of demons. Like it does remind me. And I'm just, that's just to me, one of the things I'm just looking at going like, Hey, look, I know it's not directly explicitly mentioned in the Bible, but it's to me very consistent where we see an increase of to an incredible level of wickedness to that, which God would say, nobody is good. I need to kill pretty much everybody. That reminds me a lot of demonic influence. And, you know, I feel like 
we see a very much increase in demonic influence in the U S as they fall into more idolatry, more sexual sins, more evil and wickedness on all these levels. And so, so that's, that's a little bit of a two cents there. So I, I'm not, I guess I'm not as strong in the entertainment one. I don't know. Did you have a further point to try and connect those? But I do see violence as a major piece here. Well, yeah. I mean, I was just, you know, wondering because the, um, you know, the sub, uh, I guess the counterculture movement, you know, used music and entertainment to, you know, infiltrate, to, to move against Christian morals, um, you know, promoting drugs and, and like you know, sexual like revolution. Like thinking, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. So I was just wondering whether that was something that we could t- tie in. And it's, it's of course, it's going to be a controversial theme as people don't like to look at stuff like that. But I think it's, we have to look at the the moral um, degradation in America over the last, say, 50, 60, probably more like 70 years and just see where it came from. Well, where did, where did it all come from? I mean, you know, in the 50s, they were saying when Elvis came out, they were saying that he's demonic because he's doing his little hip thing. I mean, <laughs> yeah. now they got people, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, I mean, where where did all that come from? And then, of course, the 60s, if you look, you know, because I've studied a lot of popular culture and whatnot. And in the 60s, you see like 1962, you see the Beatles, they're all wearing like suits and stuff. And then, you know, a few years later, you see them, you know, they're out on acid, they got their hair long and stuff. Not that Mm -hmm. I think there's a problem, you know, with listening to music or anything. I just think that's kind of something that we have to look at. And then, of course, when it starts getting into my, um, you know, my generation, you have things like, you know, violent music starting, um, you know, uh, just uh, say, say t- even promoting Satanism. And it's just like, whoa, man, you know, where did this come from? Uh, you know, this was totally, you know, this came out of nowhere. How did it start? So something I like See, to think about sometimes. That, that I think it, it's worth talking about as far as like music being used as a tool. But mm-hmm. the reason I'm, I'm hesitant to put too much on it, like I is because, you know what, I've been in those churches where we literally sat through Bible studies on finding the right amount of beats. That's moral because if you have too many beats, that's wrong. This music is bad and this music is good because it has this number of rhythm and notes and tracking down those things. And so that's why I'm a little bit like, all right, like we could talk about music and how I definitely agree. Music has been used to influence people for evil and to induce and bring many people into wickedness and the sexual revolution, I think is a great example. And even the Beatles is a great example and all of the violent, terrible music. I'm just not willing to go overboard where some people are like organs only in church. So yeah. as long as you, you, you still believe in listening to music, uh, Brian, yeah. I think we could uh, sure, still be sure. friends. Of course. Of course. Yeah. I never suggested, I would never suggest outlawing music. I just think, Boy, music has become See, a tool. I know people that do, so I just wanted to make sure where we're at. But I do. Oh, agree. yeah. 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 Music oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this. It's kind of a an interesting question. How do you think eschatology should or could impact our Christian walk and lives for Christ? Well... I mean, there's a lot of facets to eschatology. So as you know, eschatology also means what takes place after death, you know, and I think you've done some great work on that. You know, soul sleep was something that I looked into when I was going through my E.W. Bullinger phase because he held to soul sleep and I looked into that and I, you know, as far as that goes, I was having a conversation with Sam Frost on Facebook earlier and he's all strong for the, you know, we go to heaven when we die and stuff. And then, of course, I'm giving him texts. And I think that I don't think it's as clear cut. I think that, you know, I know you mentioned, you know, the the in your in your recent debate, I think you mentioned something about, well, there's some objections here and there's some, some objections there. And it's not always clear cut. I think, you know, that aspect of it, I, I will say I don't really know. I suspect that we go to a place of blessedness, whether it's in a locational sense, you know, I don't think it's a locational change. I I think, you know, 
unless we're talking about Abraham's bosom. And that's another, that's a whole different podcast. Um, <laughs> but as far as like eschatology, what we can look forward to corporately, um, you know, how it can impact us. It can impact us. I think if we, if we, if we, if we can, can see Christ coming back in our own lifetimes, I think we, I think we're on the right track. It doesn't mean he has to come back, you know, tomorrow or like we don't know he could come back any time, but I think there has to be a need for him, a need for the church to see him as coming back, as possibly coming back at it in any generation. And you know, you know, things can, you know, the end times people say, well, this has to happen and this has to happen. You know, that kind of stuff can happen very quickly. We saw what happened in, I think it was last October, um, with uh, with Israel and with their, you know, how all of a sudden, you know. They they start they start their war, and all of a sudden it's all over the news, and then situations rapidly change. You know this is that kind of you know stuff that can happen in a couple of weeks or a couple of years. So I don't think that's a big impediment, but I think we have to. I don't think that we should be putting like a lot of churches do, and a lot of ministers do, and a lot of um, other eschatological systems do, is putting Christ's. Um, return on the back shelf and saying it's not important to us. Um, it's not an essential doctrine. Well, it's an essential, do it's got to be an essential doctrine if you read Paul or if you read even John, it's got to be an essential doctrine because they were waiting for Christ to come in the first century. Now, we could play the preterist versus futurist game. So, well, he already came back. Now, so we're not waiting for him anymore. But it's the middle of the road club that I would argue with, the ones that say, well, it's essential because it's in the creeds, but it's not essential to us because he can't possibly come back for another 10,000 years. And now the post millennials will actually say this. They'll say that, look, it's a long-term situation and we're going to build a, we're going to build a house that's going to stand for 10,000 years. And I think that's a mistake. I think what we need to do is get back to biblical eschatology in the sense that we're still look, we're still looking for Christ's return to possibly take place. We don't know when it's going to take place, but it still has to be on our horizon. And if we do that, then we're going to be, you know, like Jesus Christ said, you know, watch, you know, watch, you know, don't, don't fall asleep, you know, watch, be ready for me to come back. Um, and that's, you know, the great commission specifically says, you know, teaching, teaching all nations whatsoever I have commanded you. So I don't think we can pick and choose what aspects of Christ's teachings we're, um, we're not teaching, you know, that are irrelevant to us today. And that's one of the, I guess that's one of the things that problems that I've had with non pre mill eschatology is that it tends to minimize the importance of the second coming. Say nothing of the timing of the second coming. It minimizes the importance. And of course, there's premillennialists who've done, who have done that as well, saying, you know, we need to do this, 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 and that saying, well, what about, you know, what about his coming back? So then you have another view that says, well, it's, it's his coming back is at death, which that solves a lot of problems. And I admit that that's, you know, I had a debate with Sam Frost, not to keep bringing his name up, but I had a debate with Sam Frost where I asked him, you know, what about Christ's return? And he said, well, it could be at death. And I wasn't against the view. I just said that that was, I don't think that's what he was talking about in Matthew 24, but there's people who have suggested that, you know, that it's, in, it's an individual coming at death. That solves a lot of problems. I mean, I don't I don't agree with that view, but I agree that that view does solve problems because now you're saying, hey, look, you know, I could go at any time. You know, I'm here today, gone tomorrow. It brings it a step closer in relevance. It makes it relevant again. Mm -hmm. So I would rather have people hold that view than the view that, you know, Christ can't possibly come back for 10,000 years. That's how I look at it.